Hey, welcome back to D-Lab. Yep, I'm back into fixing some ham transmitters. But in this case, I have a super rare Johnson Navigator. This is a CW only transmitter with a built-in VFO. They didn't make very many of them and they're gorgeous. So they're highly desired transmitters, not only for CW nuts, but a lot of guys use these as exciters to drive big transmitters. So let's take a look at this thing and then I'll show you what's wrong. So here's the navigator with the original manual. Comes to me from my friend Augie, W1LJD, out of New Hampshire. He purchased this radio and found out that one of the switches is frozen. It happens to be the crystal VFO and zero switch and you need that zero function or you can't spot the little transmitter on your receiver, right? So this is a major deal. And unfortunately, it's not real easy to replace. But let's take a look at the rest of the transmitter first. Here's the back side of the navigator. Single 6146 output tube. So you get around uh, 25 watts output on CW. Main power transformer. You have a 5U4 rectifier tube here. This is the VFO cage with the bands identified on the top for calibration. Over here is a voltage regulator tube. Chassis super clean on this thing. It is a kit. You can tell the factory models because they have rivets on the tube sockets rather than screws. But still, it looks like a very clean unit. Let's look underneath. Here's the bottom side of the navigator. You can see Johnson used high quality components. This is your power supply choke. Looks like the main filter caps have been changed. This is the switching for the VFO. There's a little cam lever that goes between 80 and 40 meter operation and the 10 11 meter. It's kind of a nifty little apparatus that Johnson came up with. The switch that we're going to be trying to repair is right here. And the problem is with repairing the switch is if you have to pull it, unfortunately the hardware is trapped between the front panel and the chassis. So the only way really to replace it is to pull the front panel. That's probably what I'm going to end up doing unless somehow I can free the switch up. I've loosened the set screw on this switch, okay? So the first thing I'm going to try doing is take a little WD-40. I'm going to hit that shaft. I'm going to come back here into the back side of that shaft and try to work the switch and see if it'll free up. If it doesn't, then we're pulling the front panel. So I've applied the WD-40 to both sides of the shaft. I put on a larger knob so I might be able to generate a little bit of torque and see if possibly she'll move. I do not see any movement on that shaft. This thing is really froze up. I don't want to apply heat to the front panel because I don't want to damage the paint. So I'm going to work this for a little bit, see if I get lucky. If not, I already know what's coming at me. So guess what? She's moving. The shaft is starting to break free. So obviously the uh, lubricant is getting in there. I don't know if it's going to be enough. But if I can just get this thing to start moving and then get more lubricant in there, the switch might be savable. Well, wishful thinking. But the switch just remains difficult to turn, so I'm going to replace it. Luckily, a fellow ham sent me an original navigator switch that will go right in here, okay? And this one turns free as a bird. So, it's time for a little surgery on the navigator. Well, here's the plan. The wafers on the switch are in great condition. And the soldering looks excellent, whereas the wafers on my donor switch 
don't look so great, but the mechanical section is fine. So I am going to take these little nuts off of here, slide the wafers back, disassemble this switch, put the mechanics of this switch in the place, slide it right back into these wafers, put the nuts on, and not have to unwire this thing. Right, so if you look right here, there's an access hole. If you take a flashlight, you look in there, you can see the set screws for the back of the vernier of the VFO, okay? So you get in there, and this will drop into that screw head, and you can loosen those screws, and then you can pull the face off of this thing without damaging the little delicate coupler that's inside the VFO. Many people have made this mistake. You've got to take your time, look through that hole, get it lined up properly, loosen those set screws, and then you can safely remove the front panel. I believe I have everything loose. One nut fell behind this thing. So you want to carefully pull this thing straight off. Okay? Don't put any bending moments on it or you're going to damage this coupler that's in here inside the VFO cage. That'd be a stinking nightmare, believe me. Okay? So now, I'm going to carefully inspect it and make sure nobody's done it in the past. It looks good. Thank God. All right. There's that nut I was looking for. Now we have access to the switch. Crystal VFO switch is loose. Now the big question is, is can I retract it enough to turn it towards me, remove the hardware, slide the new workings in it, and put it back without having to unwire? So what appears to be the showstopper is this big green pigoramus cap that's jammed in behind the switch. So I'm going to remove that cap get it out of my way, do what I need to do, and then put a modern cap in its place. All right, that's out of my way. Now I've got some tight leads here on this coil and this black wire here. I think once I free that up, I should be able to slide it back. So I'm able to get the switch free. So I should be able to navigate it around, get the hardware off, slide those wafers, and put in the new front end. All right, now time for the tricky part. I have my switch assembly indexed the same as the one installed. So I'm gonna take those nuts off, slide everything back, put it on here, put her back together. All right, doing good. I've got the new assembly slid in here. The spacers are installed. I just need to get the nuts on the back side and reinstall. All right, mission complete. Took a little bit of surgery with some tweezers, but I was able to get the workings installed. The nuts are back on. The switch is ready to go back into place and I only have to hook up two wires and change that one cap. All right, so everything's back in place. There's the new switch. I've cleaned and lubed it. It's time to get the front panel on and test this thing. All right, so you're probably wondering, while I have access to this VFO, why don't I just remove the cover and change out the famous Chernobyl resistor that feeds the OA2 inside the VFO compartment? Well, guess what? The navigator doesn't have one. There's no OA2. There's no 18K flame-out resistor. So to verify what I just told you about the OA2 not being in this VFO, Take a look at my little scope here, okay? I'm looking inside of that hole right now, and what you're seeing is the hole where the tube socket would normally mount for the OA2. Some of the navigators may have it, but this one doesn't. It's a good thing to check before you tear it all apart to change that resistor. Well, that was big fun, but actually pulling the front panel off of the navigator is much easier than a Ranger or a Valiant. You can see our switch is cool now. Everything's ready. Let's test it.
All right, navigator's fired up. Here we go, transmit mode. Boing, boing, boing on that meter. It's too bad that they use such a garbage meter on such a beautiful transmitter. But it is working. Now I need to hook up to receiver and make sure that when I do this, I hear the spot when I'm on standby. All right, I fired up my little DX150B. Here is our spot function. So it is working as designed. So what fun that was, huh? That's the difference between working on guitar amps and ham radio gear. The ham stuff always has a lot of cool surprises waiting for you. And if it wasn't for KE9UA, Dennis Mills, I wouldn't have been able to fix this thing. He just happened to scrapped out a navigator and sent me a box of goodies and that switch was in there. So thank God, man, us hams, we stick together, get the job done. Here at D-Lab Electronics.